He's also got two copies of Scavenging Ooze, if you can get to that. That's problematic that's for, for yeah. Gorio's Vengeance. But he's also got a lot of stuff like Tarmogoyf and Maelstrom Pulse and Hut Master of the Fells that are close <laughs> to dead cards in the matchup. If Joe has a functioning hand, a lot of these cards do very little. All right, so Bruce is going to go ahead and start just on a Verdant Catacombs, and we can see where Joe starts. It's a Gemstone Mine into Faithless Looting. Now, you have to watch out for the early turns with this deck. Joe can win without wasting any time. And what I really like about this deck is four copies of Is It Charm. Is It Charm mm -hmm. is very powerful as a looting effect. It's also a way to push through your combo against counter spells. So very flexible card. Interesting here. So Joe is going to be hesitant to put a creature in a graveyard unless he can reanimate it right away. So you mentioned Scavenging. It's a card that stops Joe's entire combo. Um, actually, Joe can kill it with Is It Charm, mainly because creatures rarely end up in either player's graveyard in this matchup. Joe's not killing anything, and he rarely bins creatures of his own. Here, though, you see he discards Gristlebrand and a copy of Pull from Eternity. And Pull from Eternity takes a card from Exile and puts it into the graveyard. And Joe actually puts cards there. He plays Gemstone Caverns, Fury of the Horde. Those all put cards in Exile, as well as Serum Powder. But he didn't do it, Serum Powder or Caverns in his opener, so Pull not a good card, which is why he's discarding it. Yep. Now, Scavenging Ooze, as you mentioned, Joe's going to avoid trying to put something in the graveyard until he actually can go. Scavenging Ooze with green mana up can kind of muck things up. Mm -hmm. So if, if Bruce had an Ooze here, he would force Joe to try to combo next turn. But instead he has Tarmogoyf. We do see Creature, Instant, and Sorcery, and Land. So it's already a 4-5. But if you look at this deck, I mean, it's a lot of staple or cards you could imagine being staples of busted legacy decks. All right, so here's Gorio's Vengeance. This is one of the things that Joe wants to do. He was playing pretty fair here. It's going to come into play. Gristlebrand will swing for seven with Lifelink in haste. Now we'll see whether or not Joe can just win this turn. As you mentioned, this is this is the fast combo deck of the format. And you're seeing uh, another reason for pull from Eternity being in the deck is that Gristlebrand gets exiled here. So in the mm -hmm. event that Joe isn't able to kill this turn, if he finds pull from the Eternity, he can put Gory, uh, Gristlebrand back into the graveyard and be able to reanimate it down the line. So you see here, Joe went up to 27 on that attack. Now he's going to draw seven. It is almost certain that this is the last turn of the game. Yep. Joe's going to and but it's, it's fun to see in action. So Joe goes under 20. Now he's going to go down to 13 to draw seven more. I assume he goes all the way down to six just to find copies of Fury of the Horde and red cards. Yeah, and it looks like he's found a Fury of the Horde here, so. So the deck actually is not flush on red cards, so there's a lot of resources that go on here. But when he finds one, he can exile two cards or other red cards in his hand to cast Fury of the Horde for free, which is what he's going to do now, and means that he gets to untap Gristlebrand and have another attack phase. Which is seven more cards, another opportunity to find Fury of the Horde and, and the corresponding red cards and just try to kill in one shot. And even if he fails to kill this turn, he can try to set up, you know, pull from Eternity plus a reanimation spell for next turn and go go for it again, or simply discard another copy of Gristlebrand that's in his hand, what have you. And you see two through the breaches are exiled there. So Gristlebrand gets to untap and he attacks again. Bruce goes to five. Joe draws seven more. So he went up to 20 again from Gristlebrand's lifelink hit. Looks like he's found another Fury and two more red cards. So that's going to be a lethal attack. Bruce is dead, played a Tarmogoyf, but that was not enough. Game one goes over to Joe Lissette. And Joe, looking at the camera, giving a oh, little knows it. cool me off gesture there. <laughs> and yeah, that's why that's why you can see, uh, you know, Gorio's Vengeance is pushing the boundaries of what should be permissible in the modern format, even if the deck has not put up particularly good results. Because that was a turn two kill. And it didn't a, take that much. A turn two kill that's very hard for most decks to interact with, unless uh, your opponent had a counter spell at the ready there or a discard spell. Uh, or some way to interact with the or graveyard. Thoughtsies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Bruce just played a Tarmogoyf on turn two and did not get to untap. Uh, that's something that very, very rarely happens in modern. Yeah, this, I believe, like I said before, I believe this is one of this and Gorgeous Vengeance and Amulet are the decks that can turn two and turn one. They're both Simeon Spirit Guide decks. Um, I think that the dangers, just, I mean, I'm going to throw this out here, is that uh, a, a deck like Amulet requires, I mean, it is actually very powerful and maybe is also pushing that boundary. Gray's Vengeance can do it with fewer cards. Um, that said, the number, the cards you have to put in your deck to make this engine work are a lot more questionable. You have a higher fail rate. You have a lot more games where you're mulliganing down to four and just sort of dying than a lot of the other Your hands decks. look real bad sometimes. But your, your really good draws <laughs> are really good, and we just saw that on display game one. All right, so let's look at the players' sideboards here. So we'll start with Bruce. This one's pretty easy because he's got a lot of cards that he just doesn't want anywhere near the matchup. A Sewing Salt, a Renning Volley, a Graft Digger's Cage, a Feed the Clan, two Obstinate Battleoth, an Outpost Siege, an Olivia Valderan, a Grim Lavamancer, an Ancient Grudge, 
a Golgari charm, a Shatterstorm, and three Pulpiteer Mage. I mean, there's not a whole lot going on here. There's a Graphickers Cage. That's, That's very great. good. Yeah. But other than that, I, I mean, this is a pretty light sideboard for the matchup. Yeah, it looks like it's really just one card. There's not much else he can use. Yeah, I mean, he can, he can bring in things like his copy of Grim Hovamancer and try to speed it up a little bit, remove some of his clunkier threats like Hummaster, but uh, this, is, this is trouble for Bruce. All right. Well, before we go to Joe's sideboard, one thing we now have, which is the StarCityGames.com newsletter that we're going to tell you about. If you guys aren't, have not been subscribed, this is members of Premium. We now have a weekly newsletter. Yeah, and this is a great synopsis of everything that's been going on the website. It gets released every single week. There's content that Cedric Phillips selects both from the Premium and the Select side uh, to recommend for you. There's a exclusive Cardboard Crack comic. There's some articles from writers like we've had Nick Miller, like we've had Ed Irwin talk about what they would do uh, for Friday Night Magic. There's just a lot of good content in the newsletter. It's very easy to get signed up for. You can go to the website and sign up on the top banner. This comes every week, and it's a very good summary of the content that's available and some content that's exclusive to the newsletter. Yeah, this is and this is something that I believe. Yeah, we've had newsletters in the past uh, with with premium, but this is really I really like where this is going. Right, it's a it's a great. I mean, I ne don't necessarily go to the website every single day, but every time this comes into my inbox, I check it out. It's usually mm -hmm. a good recommendation or two for articles, the cardboard crack comic, uh, the crossword puzzle. It's just a good brief summary of what's going on on the website. All right, so the, look, looking at Joe Lissette's sideboards, we kind of talked about what Bruce can do. He has two copies, actually, of Leyline of Sanctity in his main deck, so he has two more in his sideboard. Um, against a discard-heavy deck like Jund, which that's Jund's main way of interacting here. I would expect him to use that. The other kind of cards he has in his sideboard, he has a Gemstone Mine, um, which so he has one extra land. He has four copies of Silence. He has a Back to Nature, a Pyroclasm, three Torpor Orb, and three Thought, thought Ceases of his own. Now, I expect him to use these other Ley Lines to fight against Bruce's discard. But outside of that, I mean, when you have such a streamlined combo deck, you're really just targeting individual decks with your sideboard. Silence looks like it would be for blue decks for the primarily um, Torpor Orb for decks like Twin, Thought Seize, perhaps against other sort of synergy-based decks. But I, other than the Ley Lines, I don't see too much that Joe will go toward. I agree. I mean, yes, you can make an argument for Thoughtseize to attack Bruce's discard spells, but I think the cost of sideboarding in this deck is very heavy because this deck is almost all engine. There's there's very little fat. So I think the, the he, Joe goes up to the full play set of Ley Lines, try to lock out the discard spells. But beyond that, I think uh, Joe probably doesn't touch a sideboard here. Remember, the turn zero here matters, Joe. Postboard with up to four copies of Leyline of Sanctity and three copies of Serum Powder often does have actions, have pregame actions of his own. Yeah. I, I mean, if you like playing Legacy, this is the closest you can get to playing Legacy in Modern, in my opinion. It's yeah. a lot of the same elements. Uh, you see a lot of the same cards here, really using the graveyard as a resource, trying to generate some explosive kills. You see Joe using Serum Powder to take a new hand. He exiles those seven. Now, this is where those copies of Pull from Eternity can come into play. If Joe exiles a creature there, that does let him entomb a creature, if you will. A lot of synergies here. I think Bruce will want to check what's in there. We see some lands. There is a Gristle Brand hanging out. Joe's new seven's a keeper, and now another pregame action will put Leyline of Sanctity into play. Pretty good opening here for Joe, to say the least. But... Bruce with the one of out of the sideboard. He starts the game on Graft Digger's Cage. That is an easy keep for Bruce, and one that Joe's going to have a very difficult time beating. Yeah, there's through the breach as a way to kind of get around it, but uh, his graveyard, I believe, is likely shut off here. I don't think he has a way to get that card off of the table. I suppose he can through the breach Emrakul and then mm -hmm. <laughs> go from there, but... Yeah, so now he'll have to use his copies of Through the Breach. Uh, a lot of his deck is turned off. The Glorious Vengeances don't do anything. When it comes to getting up to five mana for Through the Breach, he's going to look to cards like his three of Pentad Prism and cards like Simeon's Spirit Guide. He's only an 18 land deck, so casting a five mana Through the Breach could be pretty difficult. Pentad Prism is a very good route, though. Yeah, that'll get him to five very quickly. And he's going to be able to set up Through the Breach pretty much uncontested because of Leyline. So uh, this is a really good opening here for Bruce, but it still may not matter. I believe Joe does have a copy of Through the Breach. I don't know what monster he has in his hand to put into play, so if he has one at all. But Through the Breach is waiting. As Scavenging Ooze starts beating in, Joe goes down to 17, taking one off that mana confluence as well. And now we'll see, does he have a creature to put into play? Looks like he may have a Gristlebrand. Yeah, it looks, you see him shuffling a Grizzle Band up to the front. Does have five mana. So now I think what could go wrong if he goes for Grizzle Brand? 
off two mana on Bruce's side. He does have the mana for Terminate. But Joe's going to go for it. Here's through the breach. Here comes Gristlebrand. It's not Emrakul. That's good news for Bruce. Here's an attack. See if Bruce does have a card like Terminate. It does not appear so, though. Bruce goes down to 13, and Joe up to 24. He's going to get to draw 21 here, and he may just be able to end the game. Well, I think the issue may be Twilight Mire as the land over on Bruce's side of the table. Oh, you're right. That's actually, it's not a, it's not an overgrown tomb. Yep. He can't make, you're right, so he doesn't have a kill spell that could take care of Grizzlebrand. Yeah, he has Terminate in hand. Wow. Okay. And this was the cost... Last turn, Bruce played Treetop Village in lieu of Swamp. He could have had Terminate Mana available. Mm -hmm. He may have overestimated how safe he was here. Yeah, he goes down to 13. Joe draws 7. Goes to, so up to 24, deck down to 17. He's going to need to find two, cop two Rally the Hordes, or, or Fury of the Hordes, and then four other red cards. The other option is if Joe draws up a pretty potent hand here, he can just say, okay, whatever, untap and go for Through the Breach on Emrakul the following turn. He'll draw seven again, go to 10. Now, there is some danger about taking that last seven. If he goes to three, he could get lightning bolted. I don't think we'll see Joe do that. Well, we may. Uh, well, no, wait, he's, he has Leyline. He has Leyline. Yeah, but he, okay. he is facing out a treetop village, so he's not going to be pushing himself to five or lower, and probably even uh, higher than that because of the mana confluence he needs his mana. Mm -hmm. So here's a Fury of the Horde. He is found. Does have... Some number of is it charms and faithless lootings should be able to discard to this, it. This is looking like potentially a turn three kill against Grafdigger's Cage on the heels of a turn two kill. Yeah. And it'll go one more. Bruce down to six, Joe up to 16. He's just gonna have to find another Fury. Joe goes down to, he's gonna activate, go down to nine. Does he find another Fury of the Horde? Seeming Spirit Guide, Gorio's Vengeance, Faithless Looting. I don't know if he has the next Fury. So then the question becomes, does he have a hand that's good enough to the point where he doesn't have to bother trying to go for the kill this turn? And if he's setting aside seven here, I think Joe's saying, I'm not going to push my luck this turn and just go for the kill next turn. Well, he can use that Spirit Guide to cast Faithless Looting if he wants to take another shot at it. There is some worry that if he lets Bruce on tap, he opens up the door to cards like Maelstrom Pulse. That said, if, if Joe has a good enough setup here, he, he doesn't really have to care. I think that if he's got a land, a Simeon Spirit Guide, a Through the Breach, and something to put into play, uh, especially Emrakul, that's going to be good enough for Joe to win. He doesn't have to get too greedy here. Yeah, him going to zero, especially when he can't take Burn to the face, is probably, it's very unlikely. Yeah. Yeah, looks like he'll keep Bruce to six. Yeah, once he puts Emrakul through the Breach, that will play around any of Bruce's removal. But I don't think Joe's going to get too risky here. He's looked at so much of his deck that I would imagine assembling the kill for next turn is not going to be too hard. See it here, tons, a lot of discards there. You're right, Simeon Spear Guide through the Breach, Emrakul looks, appear to be what Joe has kept. Very solid set of cards here. And that's the scary part. When you have a deck that's this fast of a combo deck, there's so much pressure that you put on your opponent. And we mentioned the Treetop Village versus Swamp play from Bruce, or even perhaps playing Twilight Mire instead of Swamp. I mean, he needed to do that so he could play Scavenging Ooze, but that one situation is enough that it may have cost Bruce the game. And that's something you see more in large formats like Modern and like Legacy. People are not necessarily familiar with the decks that are on the fringes of the format. I think Bruce might have felt that he was just safe with Grafinger's Cage. And he saw, even saw through the breach, I believe, in game one as Joe was going off with Fury of the Horde, but the total enormity of the situation I don't think registered. And to be fair, if the creature that Joe puts through the breach is Emrakul instead of Gristlebrand, that doesn't even matter. Yep. I mean, the, the question is how much is getting your, getting your treetop village into play matter. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's not very much. Bruce would have been better served holding up Terminate. But that said, that's an advantage of playing a deck like this. And Joe, one of the cards he lets go is an Emrakul. He's going to try to shuffle it in. And I, th I think that should still shuffle, even with Graftigger's Cage. 
Yeah, I think Bruce. Yeah. I, I, well, I think the thing is Bruce is saying here that he's floated green green off the Twilight Mire. He removed the Gristle Brand, and now I believe would like to exile the Emrakul as well. With the trigger. And now it's an issue of have we've gone too far. And it may be a situation here, even though Joe had started a shuffle, if if the judge rules that Bruce that Bruce still has the opportunity to remove Emrakul, they can actually fix this by just getting an Emrakul out of Joe's deck because it would be functionally the same situation. It doesn't matter if it's the right Emrakul. Right, there's, there's there is no, a fix. There's been no scrying here. There's not, not, Joe doesn't know anything about the order of his well, deck. He's, gonna, he's just about to shuffle. Exactly, too. yeah. There's nothing... Th this is an easy one to correct. The question is whether or not Bruce missed the window to exile Emrakul. I don't... It doesn't appear that it will affect the outcome of the game. Uh, what Bruce... The big thing I think what Bruce wants is he wants the extra 1-1 one -one counter on scavenging is. Yeah. If he could... This is interesting. If if he had enough mana to get the ooze up to a 5-5, five five, ooze plus village could put Joe to 1, and Joe wouldn't be able to use the mana confluence. Yeah. Now, as it looked appears, he can put Joe to 2, but that's not going to be enough. Right, and, and Joe still has to be worried. You know, the there's no lock that it doesn't matter here, because what if Bruce has random pump spells in his deck, or something weird can definitely happen here. So mm -hmm. if Joe can save himself the plus 1, plus 1 counter on the scavenging ooze, he's, he's well served to do so. Yeah, but right now they're good. This, this, the judges will be on this one and figure out just what is going to happen with that Emrakul. So as it lies, there's an Emrakul trigger on the stack, perhaps. We don't know right. whether or not there was a chance to respond to it. Still looking like a pretty solid situation there for Joe. I, I think he's got a hand that's solid enough to go off next turn. He still has Leyline of Sanctity in play, so his hand's protected from various discard spells. The scavenging is, even in the event that it is allowed to take the counter, will go up to a 4-4, with Tree Top Village at 7. Joe will go into play at to his next turn at 2, one presumes. Mm -hmm. 2 is enough where he can tap the mana confluence for mana, do his thing. So things are looking very solid yeah. for Joe, but not, not a lock just yet. Well, as long as the land Joe kept isn't another mana confluence, uh, which I presume he didn't, but that fourth land is actually tricky. If you look at the lands in Joe's deck, he has one Swamp and three Gemstone Mine. Those don't make... Those are fine, but the other one's a... Uh, Mana Confluence, City of Brass, Black Cleave Cliffs, those don't actually work here. He needs land four. Now, he's got a lot of cards, so I bet he's kept one that works. I'm sure he has a hand that's capable of doing it because he looked at 21 cards that turn or, mm. or whatever the case may be. Uh, he does have to be worried about potentially something like Maelstrom Pulse plus Discard Spell if Bruce is able to tag the Ley Line and then attack Joe's hand. Sure. So if Joe can leave his hand as redundant as possible, you know, ideally... Two copies of Emrakul, two copies of Through the Breach, two copies of Sidney Spear Guide in the land. That would be now, the if, if, if he has that kind of recipe, I, I think Joe wants to have that because it's not a lock that he doesn't get hit by a discard spell next turn. With that said, uh, looks like a very solid position to be in. And we almost saw there a turn three kill through Grafticker's Cage. Uh, this yeah. deck is capable of some very explosive openings. It seems like right now that Bruce is playing on borrowed time. I almost would have expected that one to, to go all the way. Yeah, it's... Uh, this deck can get some very impressive draws. There's no two ways about it. Now, yeah, from a philosophical standpoint, it introduces a very interesting question, which is, we obviously see people die on turn three and before sometimes in modern. Is it required to, to, for R&D to ban out of those decks every single time? Or are we willing to say, turn four is what we want kind of the, the powerful and consistent decks to be doing. If there's some volatile turn three kills, turn two mm -hmm. kills roll in, maybe we're happy with those existing. I know there's the other side of the equation where people would just be happier if Gorgo's Vengeance wasn't part of the format at all, because all it does is facilitate right. the type of openings that we saw in game one. It's an interesting case study because it is testing some of the philosophical parameters that R&D initially put on the format. Well, I mean, you know, and Blazing Shoal does remain on the banned list for this reason as well. Um, and in Legacy, we have decks that can kill on turn one, but we're generally okay with that because those there's a lot of fragileness to those decks. Right. Force of Will exists in the format. Yep. And also, Legacy is more of, well, take the gloves off, and you want to wasteland lock people and kill on the first turn, and, you know, those sure, kind of decks are all... Sure, we can do that. We agree. We have an agreement about what the rules are engagement are. 
anything goes. Modern is supposed to be more of a PTQ format. It's supposed to be more of an FNM format. And so the parameters rightly change a little bit. We don't want the format to be all about turn one kills and locking people out with strip mine effects and, and, and so on. Uh, with that said, when the card pool expands, you are going to find these outlier cases. As the card pool gets bigger and bigger, usually it means decks kill faster, not slower, because mm -hmm. synergies start manifesting and, and weird cards start interacting. Uh, and it's an interesting case study to see uh, is the turn three or before is no good. Is that a firm, defined rule of the format? Or is R&D willing to say, we can let this go if the deck's not particularly good? For the time being, it seems that they are in the latter camp. But if Gorio's Vengeance starts picking up popularity, I think they're going to be much quicker to act against this sort of deck than, say, Splinter Twin or yeah. Birthing Pod or some of the other turn four decks that have defined the format at various points. Now, do you think that the Gorio's Vengeance deck is different than something like Amulet Combo, which also has a turn two kill? Uh, Amulet Combo is a deck that has a turn two kill, but when it doesn't hit its turn two kill, actually plays a mid-range game. You know, it actually it plays a fair, a fair-ish game of Magic where it's going, you know, it has this Teleria West engine, but it's slower and mid-rangier. Whereas Gorio's Vengeance is a deck that's really trying to turn two, kill someone, and in case that fails, is trying to turn three them, and that's that's the game plan. Amulet's, Amulet's best draws still at least involve a permanent that can be targeted by a variety of cards. And I think that puts the deck in a very different prism than something like Gorio's Vengeance, which is putting something in the graveyard and taking it out. It's just easier to naturally interact with what Amulet's doing with its most explosive draws. Now, it can as you mentioned, sort of turn and become a mid-range Primeval Titan deck. Yeah, it's it's not always just like this fast combo deck. It has a it's a it has a fast combo element, but it's not devoted to it. Amulet at the end of the day is still putting permanents into play that are pretty easy to target and it's casting them out of its hand. And that I think is a very different case than something that's putting something into the graveyard and reanimating it. The modes of interaction that the average person has is just much more limited against something like Gorio's Vengeance than it is against something like Amulet Bloom. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they took action on one, both, or neither deck over the course of Modern's history. Sure. And on the surface, they are very similar in the sort of uh, philosophical test that they put on the format. With that said, I, I think that Amulet is definitely a more powerful deck, definitely has a, yeah. a better tournament pedigree at this point, but because it's involved casting spells out of the hand and, and winning with permanence uh, that it's casting out of the hand, I think it's just a much different case study than something yeah, it, like Gorio's It does Vengeance. involve attacking with a six mana creature at one point, so, I mean, you can beat it with Path to Exiles. Even. Right, and that's a much harder thing to do, especially when Emrakul is involved with the kill. Or Gris you have a removal spell for Gristle Brad, but the person's still drawing they draw a million 14, cards. It's, now, it, you still lost. You can still win games when your Primeval Titan gets killed because of the value it generates, but it's a, on a much different scope than something like Emrakul or Gristle sure. Brad, which it, what they do is so front-loaded on the creature just entering play in the first place, not even necessarily connecting once. All right, well, we have our judge call resolved, so we're going to bring you back into the match here. So they, it did turn out that the an Emrakul was exiled from Joe's deck, so Bruce's, Tarmo, Bruce's scavenge moves rather, goes up to 4-4. Four, four. Then Joe proceeds to shuffle. So we will go to Bruce's turn four. He has seven damage on the table, as we kind of alluded before. It's one short of the number he needs. Seven means very little here, because Joe can go into his turn at two, be able to tap his mana confluence, and most likely generate a kill. And with that ley line in play, there's not going to be too much burn that he could have. Now, Bruce does, is sitting on at least one copy of Thoughtseize. So can he pulse and Thoughtseize? Does he have a way to get that enchantment off? Two copies of Maelstrom Pulse in his deck. Scavenging Ooze will swing no village with it, so it will put Joe down to five. And he is just going to pass the turn. Had the option of Huntmaster of the Fowls, but I think he's going to sit back on Terminate. He's just hoping that it's Gristle Brand and that Terminate yeah. does something. Agree, though. I think he knows it's unlikely to be Gristle Brand. Here, four mana. Joe will go down to four. Simeon Spirit Guide will be mana five. Here's another through the breach, and this time it's going to be the Eldrazi. Emrakul enters play, attacks, annihilates all six of Bruce's permanents and his life total. There is now no memory of Bruce participating in the game. <laughs> zero life points and zero <laughs> permanents. The perfect. If Bruce was a, can we call it the perfect if Bruce isn't at 15? Well, he still has a graveyard too, so it's not okay, quite. So we it's didn't not, get everything. That's close enough. It's probably close enough for Joe's purposes. Terminate, Huntmaster of the Fells, land, thought sees Spruce's hand. Though none of those will help him. He can't gain eight life. 
Even if he could, would he really want to? <laughs> would if, you he wanna... had, if he had feed the clans right now, just, just went to, to 18. Yeah. And there you have it. 2-0, Joe Lissette moves on with Gorio's Vengeance. That's not a deck I expected to see this weekend. This is, a, uh, this is but... a deck that is definitely worth looking out for. Because if this deck is <laughs> oh, good, man. if this deck is powerful, it's not going to stay around for very long. As long as it's something that's sort of cute and on the fringes of the format, R&D is likely to say, this is okay. Well, we, we can let people right. do this sort of thing. Well, that was something, you know, like when...